All right. Up until this point, we've just been doing stuff in the client, right? This is uh, uh, very easy stuff that anyone can do on their local machine, um, but it's all been browser focused. We're not quite making that jump today to the server side, but we're, we're taking the necessary step there so that, um, so that you, uh, you, you can move up forward in the coursework and start uh, focusing more on the server side, which is really what makes your, your web app a web app and not just a web page. So today, what do we got? Uh, I hate how my loses focus sometimes. I'm not sure what. <clears throat> We're going to talk about the Ruby programming language. Wonderful language. Big fan. Big advocate. We'll talk about objects. Ruby is an object-oriented programming language. And as we go... A little bit fur further, uh, next week starting, we're going to talk uh, about objects more in depth. So today we're just going to talk about what are commonly called primitive types in other languages. <clears throat> Whoops. Um, this idea of variables, you know, we're talking about now uh, directly, well, not directly, but uh, interfacing with the computer's physical memory. The RAM and storing values in the RAM for later retrieval. That's what uh, variables allow you to do. Uh, string interpolation is very handy in web applications. Well, it's handy everywhere because, I mean, we are a, a highly literate society and a lot of what we do with programming is, uh, you know, just kind of uh, slotting in values in boilerplate documents. Poor, poor, uh, poor example, but uh, yeah, string interpolation lets you take these values that you've stored in memory and construct new strings. And I think, uh, well, you'll, you'll see why that's important for web, uh, web development, especially. Uh, control flow. Sometimes you want some code to be executed in certain situations. Other times you don't want that code to be executed. Um, all programming languages have this, uh, this measure of control. We'll talk about methods um, and hashes and arrays. Let's just move forward here. A lot of this stuff, I mean, it's like with computers and computer programming. Um, what you're going to see here today is would probably take about a week in you know, a first year university class, so CPSC 201 at the UFC, uh, we'd probably be t spending you know, three classes plus two hours of lab time just discussing the concepts today. You're getting this all sandwiched into the space of an hour, which is, it might seem disad disadvantageous. Is that a word? Disadvantageous. Uh, but really when it comes down to it, you can talk about it all the time. You can talk about it all day. The only way you're going to learn it is just by doing it. It's like the first time you learn to use hold a pencil. Um, you just have to keep doing it, and eventually it clicks. So a programming language, uh, this is the Wikipedia definition. I think it's fairly sufficient. Um, read at your leisure. Uh, sometimes we have to think about computers in like terms of brains. They're not really that. They're more like uh, engines in a car or maybe a player piano where you've got one of those big... Uh, big sheets of paper with the holes punched out. And as you turn the crank, uh, the keys go down depending on which, which hole has been cut in that paper. That's really what a computer is doing. So when we're making computer programs, we're programming computer, uh, we're punching those holes. And this is a very direct analogy because uh, everything boils down to zero and one. So it's either on or it's off or the hole's been punched or it hasn't been punched. Um, direct parallel. So the inventor of the Ruby programming language is this ge gentleman here. I always get a kick out of this picture because you know he's just like being a cheese ball on purpose. But and that's just the kind of guy's name, the, the kind of guy he is. Um, uh, Yuki Hiro Matsumoto uh, created the Ruby programming language. He's a Japanese computer scientist, um, and he's just got this ethic that is unusual in people and in programmers certainly. Uh, a very charismatic individual. Um, and he, devent, he designed Ruby just to make himself happy, basically. And that's really the core of computer scientists. It's, I mean, it's, uh, it's for so long, it was just like hippies trying to impress their friends. Um, he's kind of doing it for himself. And he's got this, this idea that code should be beautiful. And immediately you start to think, oh, it's got to be a beautiful solution to a problem. No, and I can't speak for him. But I think he just likes it to look good, like visually good. And that's, it's, it's, a, it's an unusual concept. So Matsumoto, uh, good read. Check him out on Wikipedia. He's uh, the, the father of all this. 
Okay. Um, so I'm going to kind of burn through a lot of this stuff because, as I said, we can talk about it, uh, but you're not really going to get it until you know we start putting pen to paper, so to speak. Um, but we're going to be talking about objects in a couple of slides. And what we're seeing here are different, different objects that are, are core to, I'd say, probably every computer language. Different types of data are treated differently by the interpreter or compiler. Um, here, we just got to look at this and we got to say, like, well, a string is very different than an integer. I mean, we've all gone through high school and university and all that kind of stuff. So, I mean, you can see that difference right away there, right? So how do you encode this data? How do you treat it? Um, we have data types, and these data types in Ruby are objects because everything in Ruby in Ruby is an object. So different data types, strings like you'd read on a piece of paper, uh, integers, you know, whole numbers, no decimal points, floats, decimal points, and then the Boolean, named for George Boole, I think he was a uh, logician, philosopher in the 18th century. Uh, set the groundwork for digital digital electronics. The history of computer science goes back an amazing long time back in the future, back back in the past. The boolean is very much like the zero and the one. If it's true, the value is one, or the light switch has been turned off, or the hole has been punched in your player piano. The false is the zero. One or zero. In this case the light switch would be off or there'd be no hole in the paper in the player piano. Um, so what we're seeing here are variables. We have this data, Yukihiro Matsumoto, or Mats. Um, by following this, this, this syntax, we declare a variable name on the left-hand side. So this is kind of like the properties that you see in CSS or the attributes in um, HTML. When you declare this variable, there's a little spot in your computer's RAM that just gets allocated. Um, and then when you set this equal, to a value, this is what gets uh, set in that space in memory. In memory, if you think of it just like as a long stack of tape or, or, a, or a long strip of tape. Um, and usually it's 64 bits wide. Um, each one of these would be a new row or a new slot in that line of tape. There's a few more, oh yeah, I don't want to delve down into like the deeper, deeper uh, principles here, but uh, just just note that uh, by doing this, by assigning these values, these things are there, and then we can we can uh, bring them back later for for whatever reason. Um, okay, so yeah, some code style guidelines. So the biggest thing so far has been indentation, and from what I've seen, you've all been pretty good about making sure you you know every time you nest something, you indent uh, when you're naming variables. Like these are good things, good names for variables. And this is for your benefit. The computer doesn't care like with anything, right? Um, if we said this was like var one or something, that's a bad variable name because someone's gonna come and read this or you're gonna look down your long uh, document of code here and you're gonna say, what, what the heck is var one? And you're gonna have to go all the way back and try to decipher it. So really just to keep your own sanity, give them descriptive names. So, Having taught, you know, or done the lab component for first computer, your computer science for so long, this is very typical. You know, you give it A or you give it X, unless you're calculating Pythagoras' theorem or something like that. These are bad variable names. Stuff. Counter's pretty good. Describes what it is. Output's kind of silly. Response, this one's kind of funny, too, because this is actually one of the, well, at least parameter names that uh, we commonly use in uh, Sinatra. But uh, yeah, let it just describe its contents. Someone's looking at your code, is that, is that person gonna understand what you intended to be stored in this spot in memory? So, oh, and this is string interpolation. See, I'm just burning through this stuff. This stuff you kinda gotta see. Um, but what we have here, a couple of uh, values stored in memory for later retrieval, and we want to incorporate them into some you know, descriptive string that's going to be delivered to the end user. The way we do this in Ruby is by using this uh, weird little hashtag curly brace notation. Uh, another important point to note are these double quotes. Uh, when you're talking about string data, you can use double or single. 
But if you want to interpolate data, like we're doing here, um, you need to use double quotes. So that's gonna, this is gonna be a gotcha. And I guarantee some of you are gonna make that mistake. But when the computer receives this, having had these variables set in memory, um, this string, this new string takes on a new value. Suppose you output it to screen or output it to the browser. It's gonna say mats, because that's the value stored in name, is 35 years old. Right. We'll see a little bit more of an in-depth uh, example of that shortly. Okay, controlling flow. This is when you want certain lines of code to execute in certain situations and not in other situations. To achieve this, we use what's called uh, an if else construct. Um, and we're talking now again about Boolean values. So if some condition is true, so this is just plain English, and this is the best way to think about it. If the conditions provided here are true, you know, execute some code. If this evaluates to false somehow, skip over this code and execute this instead. And there's many different ways to construct an if else if else construct. Here's a, a more practical example. What we have here is somewhere up in your code or maybe somewhere else in your, in your overall application, uh, you set a variable called mins ago. Somewhere in there it says mins ago equals some number. Mins ago equals 61. And now it's gonna say, okay, well, is 61 greater than or equal to 60? Yes, of course it is. 61 is greater than or equal to 60. So this line of code will be returned in this case. It's not gonna be able to put the screen necessarily, um, but this is the line that's gonna get executed. On the flip side, if mins ago, say you set it mins ago equals 45. Now 45 is greater than or equal to 60. No, that's false. Skip over this code and execute this code here instead. Um, just be note, a little heads up, the else is completely optional. You don't need to provide an else statement. This is just the catch-all. And you can chain these things together as long as you want. It's typically not good practice and it just doesn't happen very often if you're a good programmer. But usually, I mean, these conditions are limited to about three or four at most. That's just my experience. So and again, this is kind of reflecting my opinion. <clears throat> um, methods are... No, they're not really comparable to control flow a little bit. But what you're going to find as you're, you're writing your code sometimes is that um, you might start copying and pasting. You're going to take a block of code early in your program and say, oh, I could use this again, maybe somewhere down, down, down in the file. Um, a method makes it so that you don't have to keep copying and pasting. You take that, you define it, and every time you call that method, execute that method, the same code is going to get executed over and over and over again. So only, you only have to do it once. Uh, this uh, lends itself to the topic of what we call dry or dryness. Dry means don't repeat yourself. If you, uh, if you find yourself copying and pasting, then you are almost certainly doing something wrong. And start time to start looking at uh, a different construct so that uh, the, the, the code is never repeated. Uh, methods allow us to do this. <clears throat> So here's a, an example method. And this is one I think that is part of your Finstagram uh, coursework. Uh, you define this, this thing called humanized time ago. Because when you create these posts, um, um, at some point it's gonna be calculated, well, when was this post uh, created? And we find, okay, um, we don't wanna show, for example, Oh, this was, this was created 120 minutes ago because we just don't talk like that. We want to do something a little bit more natural. So we, we, we cook it up so that uh, we can start breaking it down into hours. Or we can break it down into weeks or months or even years if we wanted to. Um, but what we have here is this code. Defined in this method, which we can reuse over and over and over again. To reuse it, we simply enter... Um, the method name as defined here. So down here at the bottom, uh, we have this method call. We're executing our program. It's line by line by line by line. It gets here. It sees this, and the Ruby interpreter jumps right back up to here, 
sets the value of minutes to 120, and it starts executing the lines inside the method. So is 120 greater than or equal to 60? Yes, it is. So this is what gets executed. Uh, 120 divided by 60 is 2. So the line that's going to be returned is um, two hours ago. We jump back down to here. Two hours ago, the string value gets assigned to this place in memory called time ago. Right? And this maybe will come up on your screen. Uh, maybe, you know, I've embedded somewhere in your, uh, your HTML document. We do it again. Except now we have a different value. We've got 30. Ruby interpreter sees this. It knows that it's a method name, jumps back up into that spot in its own memory and starts executing these commands again. Minutes takes on the value 30 as set by here. This is called a, a parameter. Um, and then we run this, this, these tests. If 30 is greater than or equal to 60, it is not. We would execute this though. It's not, so we jump down to here and we say 30 minutes ago returns back down to this part in the code and it gets assigned to this new variable. So previously this one contained two hours ago, now it contains 30 minutes ago. Okay. I'm going super fast here. I think this is gonna come clear, but are there any questions? Or would you like, you'd like to save them for later? So is, sorry, is it all defined in the method like that? Like that's what the code, it's gonna look like exactly in your editor? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that's? That's exactly it. Okay. Uh, okay, and actually we could probably just copy and paste this and it would work just as is. But we'll, we'll see that when we start doing a demo. I'll, I'll walk you through these, these concepts uh, uh, one step at a time. So what I've kind of glossed over here, you might be wondering if you're really a student, it's like, well, how do I know that this value is going to be returned? Uh, the rule in Ruby is just the last line executed. So whatever gets executed last is going to be the value that gets returned back to the calling context and then in turn, in this case, assigned to this variable time ago. So we see that here. We've defined a very, uh, very trivial kind of nonsensical method here. Uh, we're just going to add two numbers together. Um, we define it as add. We come down. This is just waiting to be called. Ruby interpreter says, oh, here it is. Let's take the number five jump back up to here in the number seven. So five becomes numbers or num one becomes number or five. Uh, num two gets assigned the value of seven. We add those together. There's only one line of code here. That's all we need. This is the last line to be executed. So five plus seven is 12. Return back down to here to the calling context and assign the value 12 to the value or to this variable called added. All right. So now this is something you're going to get introduced to very quickly because this is a very natural way to structure our data. Um, um, uh, a, a nice way to take a whole bunch of different variables, so to speak, and to contain them in one big variable. That's uh, not super good way to describe it, but that's really what you're doing. And if you look at it, it looks awfully similar to what you see in CSS. You have uh, the curly braces. The only thing that's really different here is this equal sign. We don't use that equal sign in CSS, but we do in Ruby because anything that follows this equal sign is going to get stuck into the slot into your computer's uh, RAM. Um, just like CSS, you have a property which is assigned by a value. And just like CSS, it's uh, separated by the colon. Opening curly brace, closing curly brace, all these values are now contained inside one variable called post. Now, if we want to get any of this information stored out, we call this key. Here's the variable post. Uh, and then we say to Ruby, well, I want to see what's been assigned to the, the title property or the title key would probably be a more appropriate term. Um, what this will retrieve, of course, it's going to look at the post variable. It's going to look through you all here. It's going to, oh, here's title. And it's going to return great times were had, right? Uh, likewise, username is going to return Sharky. Um, one thing to note 
this uh, this colon notation are what we call symbols, and this is uh, uh, I'm not going to call it a holdover, but it's uh, inspired by an old uh, it is an old language. It's called Lisp. Lisp list processing. Uh, once upon a time, very popular in AI, and they have these concepts of symbols um, in Ruby, like Lisp. Well, actually, Lisp is depends on the kind of Lisp. It's different. Uh, we define a symbol with a colon. This becomes more important, so don't stress about it. It'll become more natural as you work through the, the coursework. Uh, one final structure, arguably less sophisticated, um, is the array. Uh, the array is uh, delimited by the square brackets, whereas the, the hash was uh, delimited by the curly brackets. Um, we don't assign keys and values or properties and values if you prefer. We just slot data into the row. It's like, uh, like my dad, he had a kidney transplant. He's got those days of the week type of uh, pill cases. Um, and each pill case, you know, has his, or each slot has its pills for the day. That's kind of like an array. Actually, that's exactly what an array is. It's just a place to, to slot that data. So now while we retrieve our data from a hash by passing a symbol or sometimes even a string, in an array, we pass a numerical value, an integer value. This is the index, and we always start counting at zero. So if I look at comments at the zero index, this is gonna to go to the very first one in the list right here. So this would return, looks like you had a great time. If I wanna get the second value, it's not number two, it's number one. Comments bracket number one would then return your flipper is showing. Um, this is a, an array containing strings specifically. In Ruby, you can stick anything into an array. It doesn't matter. And they can all be of mixed types as well. So we could have a string in one index at index zero, for example. And then we could have this entire post at index one. And maybe then this one would take on index two or something like that. We have a three item list. For my dad's case, he's got seven days of the week. Number six would be Saturday, not number seven. Okay, so this is all going to be wrapped up in your Instagram application. And as I said, I mean, there's just no way that we can sit here talking about this. This is why this is kind of successful, right? You know, I, I spent so many years in university and all this kind of stuff. Um, really, after this, you'd probably be, you know, you could probably skip the first couple of weeks in an introductory course because you're going to get that hands-on uh, um, practice. So let's do a demo. Now, just to show you from where I'm starting, I'm going to start fresh, and I, I'm always aware that this takes a little bit of time sometimes. But I'm just going to create a blank workspace, and I'm going to walk you through a very simple uh, Ruby program. Call this week two, day two. So I've got to keep these ones straight. So October. Ruby programming demo. And I just want to show you that I'm just creating a blank template. So this is uh, as close to a bare metal box, we call it, um, uh, just an operating system and some um, of the usual software and some of uh, the other goodies that uh, Cloud9 provides you by default. Uh, the other ones we've been using were just sort of set up for the HTML or Ruby specifically. Um, this one has no expectations. It's, uh, it's as bare bones as Cloud9 will offer. <clears throat> and if you're interested, uh, for those of you with Macs, usually Ruby comes installed as part of your operating system or by default with the operating system. Um, so you can do the exact same thing I'm gonna do here. Okay. <clears throat> so nothing here, just an empty directory. Uh, first thing I'm gonna do, and this is just kind of to show you, you know, hopefully to invite you to become more com comfortable with the command line. All I'm gonna do is just because I don't need this readme. This is just, you know, the default cloud nine stuff. If I wanna get rid of this on the command line, I just say RM <coughs> for remove and provide the file name. I hit enter. It didn't disappear over here, but it disappeared over here. So we know it's gone, we're not getting it back. 
Now I'm going to create, this is a really handy shortcut. I'm going to create my, my very first Ruby program or for some of you guys, your very first Ruby program. And I'm going to call it hello RB just to stick with tradition. So touch just creates a file. That's, that's what touch does. And you're going to see it appear right up here. So kind of a neat way. I think the way you'd probably be more inclined to go in an, uh, normally would be to right hand click and say new file. But that's just, you know, the, the way the, the pros do it, right? There you go. Pro tip. Sticking with tradition, this was a tradition established by the creators of the C programming language um, and followed by computer programming students around the world since then is simply to output something to standard output, just a string of text um, down here on the command line. That's uh, what the very first uh, C program did. And what they did was just said, hello, world like that. I press, or I save it. I come down here and now I've just got an ordinary text file. Same as like, what, what's the difference between it, you know, and an HTML file? I mean, really in terms of data, it's nothing. So what's inter internal syntax and the software that's going to interpret that file. So we have a Ruby program from front to back and to execute it, I can use the Ruby interpreter. Ruby is what we call an interpreted language. So just like on the command line, I say Ruby, hello.rb, I press enter, and there he is. That is the traditional first program. I invite you to do the same just, to, just because, right? Maybe this will be the start of your programming career. So step one. What puts is, is a method. And we're gonna define our own methods uh, shortly, but this is just one of the many methods that uh, comes bundled uh, with Ruby. And most computer languages have something similar. Um, C, I think is actually called printf. So that's our traditional first program. Let's, uh, let's talk about some of these data types, the, the strings, uh, the, the integers, the float values, uh, and booleans. Okay, so I'm going to say, and I'm, I'm borrowing heavily from, from the slides here, but I'm going to personalize it a little bit. I'm going to create a variable called name. When I do this, this is what uh, allocates that space in memory. Um, if I were to execute the program now, actually, that's not a bad idea. We're going to get an error. It says undefined local variable or method name. These things kind of look intimidating sometimes, but if you have a problem and you will, the best bet is just to kind of like try to decipher this as best as you can, because it's going to give you a few clues. It's going to give you the, the code that's causing the problem. In this case, name. Ruby has no idea if this is a method, if it's a, a variable, it's just some some stray bit of text and it doesn't make sense to Ruby. So this uh, program crashed, but it tells me the problem and it tells me the line in my file that the problem occurred on. So this is a very short program, right? But you can see here somewhere in the file, hello.rb on line three, we've got a problem. So if I look up, up to here and you know, cloud nine is pretty helpful. Okay. That's like the easiest debugging that you'll ever see, right? But try to get comfortable with this because that's the first thing I'm going to look at if you call for help. And it's going to be the first thing that the mentors look at if you call for help as well. So let's make this a little bit more appropriate. My name is Dan. And I'll come up with some descriptive variable names so I don't even have to explain. What does that mean? Uh... I make this much money an hour. No, actually, Lighthouse Labs treats me very well. Is rich, nonetheless, even despite my, my huge salary. Um, well, you know, I'm rich in, uh, in joy. All right, so <laughs> there we go. So at this point, you know, I still have a, a fully functional, and if I didn't make any mistakes, I have a, a Ruby program that's going to execute. It's not going to do much, but let's execute it anyway and see if it crashes. Just like with uh, your browser, take small steps, make sure everything works. Oh, there it is. Okay, so it prints out hello world. 
just like we'd expect. Started right up at the top. Program always starts right up at the top. Executes it line by line. Executed this. Output this string to standard out. This is what we call it, standard out. Then it came down to this line, found it was blank. Nothing here, okay, interpreter moves on. Comes down to here, oh, better uh, start assigning variables. Parses this instruction, this, ex, uh, this, uh, this line in the program says, okay, memory allocated, memory occupied, value's been assigned. Moves on to this one, same situation. New memory allocated, new value assigned. Salary is rich. And each of these things is going to look differently just because of the different data types we have. At this point, you know, we got really nothing, right? This is, is doing something. It's doing a lot of stuff, stuff that we take for granted every single day. And it probably took like, you know, like a couple of nanoseconds. So, but it's not especially useful. Let's do some string interpolation. So I'm using this puts method again. I think it means put string. I, I haven't had the opportunity to ask Matsumoto, but I, I think that's what it is. So I say puts, uh, I want to retrieve the value. I'll go really slow here, actually. I just want to uh, you know display this, this, this value to the screen. If I do this, run my program again, does all the same stuff I described before, it gets down to here, uh, this is the only difference. It's taking this value name and it's spitting it out to screen, to standard out. In this case, I can also do it this way. There's nothing wrong with this. I don't need to interpolate this string. I can just output the variable directly. just want to see what's inside that spot in memory. Execute. But what if I want to do this? I want to say Dan has num children, children, like that. Right, this is, this is the problem that string interpolation solves. We can take just ordinary string data. In this case, it's gonna be um, has, and children, and then we can mix it in with some uh, you know, variables stored previously in memory. If I run it now, we're gonna get a, an error very similar to what we saw before. Program's gonna crash, it's gonna halt execution prematurely. Where did it get to? Okay, so it got to line eight. It said, uh-oh, undefined local variable or method children. So that, that's actually interesting because it got to this point Name didn't give it any problems. Has didn't give any problems. Known children didn't give any problems. For some reason, it was this one. We know the problem, right? This is like just variables mixed together. It's bad syntax. Um, let's fix that. So I use double quotes when I'm doing string interpolation. I'll show you the difference in just a second. So at this point, this is what gets output to screen. Name has num children children. Hashtag curly brace, curly brace. Anything inside these curly braces uh, prefixed with this hashtag can be just be ordinary Ruby code. And whatever you execute, the last line that is executed is the one that's gonna be ultimately spit out to screen. Let's try running that again. Okay, Dan has numb children, children. Okay, it's looking good. Let's fix it up, move on. Dan has four children, which is exactly what we want. So we're starting to mix these data types. Let's try another one. He makes the uh, salary per hour like that. So this isn't gonna be quite formatted nicely, but that's okay, we don't need to dwell on it. Um, he makes eight and a half dollars an hour. There you go. 
one thing I want to do, and I just want to kind of pause here. We're going to take kind of a side road. We're going to talk about these data types because this might seem trivial. And I'm going to pose you a question when we get to get to a certain point. So um, there's a couple of ways you can interact with Ruby. Ruby by itself on the command line uh, is the interpreter. It just launches the interpreter. The interpreter takes your code, executes it line by line, interfaces with the operating system, allocates memory, does all that stuff for you so you don't have to work, worry about it. Ruby is what we call a high-level language. Low-level language, uh, you would start having to manually set places in memory, manually allocating resources. Ruby does all that stuff for you. It's a much nicer way to go, believe me. If I execute Ruby, no command, it's just waiting for stuff. It's nothing happening. The other way to do it is with what's called interactive Ruby, IRB. I hit enter and watch the prompt is going to change just a little bit. So what this is doing is it's just allowing you the opportunity to put in some one-liners. So for example, here's my first program. Hello world, there you go. What do you suppose this nil is? Any guesses? That's a hard one. Kind of an unfair question, but any guesses? What does nil mean? Yeah, not even true or false. It's a, it's kind of a weird concept, right? Um, it, it just doesn't have a value. The reason why it's showing up is because this is what's being returned from the puts method. For whatever reason, somewhere deep in the, the internal workings of Ruby, um, puts actually returns a nil. It's, oper act, uh, it's uh, interfacing with the, the external operating system so that you can see it on the command line or in standard out. Um, but at the end of the day, it returns nil, just returns nothing. So you're always returning something, even if it's nothing. Another thing we can do, we can say, uh, you know, use it as a simple calculator. Six plus seven. Hit enter. Six plus seven equals 13. Continue on. We can do variable assignments. Six plus seven. So it's going to look a little bit different. Okay, well, but now we have this value, this value 13, that's now waiting for it, to, uh, waiting to be retrieved. So I can say puts x, and there it is. Or I could say puts, uh, I don't know, 6 plus 7 equals x, like that. So we're mixing these data types. Interesting to note, and actually very important to note, this 6 plus 7, these aren't integer values. This is where it gets maybe unusual for newcomers. Um, for example, say I assign six equals six, like that. And I say seven equals seven, like that. So six has a value contained in it. Seven has a value contained in it. But I wrap them in these quotations. So when I add them together, they're going to be, do something very differently. Six plus seven what do you think it's going to be? Sixty-seven. Sixty-seven. Exactly. It's just taking one string, sticking it on to the end of the other. Let's talk a little bit about floats. So a float is something with a decimal place. 0 0.1, for example, or 1 divided by 10. However you want to look at it, uh, let's say 0 plus 1 plus zero plus one, what should this equal? 0 0.2, good. Zero plus one plus zero plus two. Three, point three. Oh, weird, right? Any guesses as to what's happening here? Why is there point zero 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 four? Look at how inaccurate these machines that we depend upon, right? Imagine this was finance or like climate science or something. We start talking about rounding errors and floating point problems. Imagine. Any guesses? Any guesses? Okay. 
different question. How many numbers are there between zero and one? Exactly. How much memory does your computer have? Less than infinity, right? <laughs> so we have to take something that is potentially infinite and, and accommodate these eventualities. So um, this is actually kind of the best it's ever been. And if you're interested in floating points and the problems with floating points and encoding these values, you know, in limited space in a 64-bit machine or, or whatever other limitation is applying here, um, this is actually an IEEE standard. So just something to be aware of. Okay, so some of the fun stuff you can do with the Ruby interpreter, and this is uh, kind of handy uh, for debugging. Uh, typically, I don't use it very much, but it's a very valuable tool, uh, especially for beginners. And just to try stuff out and uh, weed out syntax errors, that's going to be your biggest problem. So I'm done with IRB. I want to get out. There's a couple ways you can do it. I think quit will do it. Yeah, quit will take you back to the bash command line. There's another shortcut way. Control D. Hold Control, press D. Um, that well, oh, I just closed my browser, my my tab. That's the other thing Control D does. It's like basically just quit this as soon as you can. If you're executing a program, or if it starts going off, you know, forever and ever and ever, and it's never going to stop executing. Control D or Control C will will get you back to the the command line. Now I just lost my. I want new terminal. There we go. I want my bash back. All right. So here's my shell. Uh, where did we leave off? Ruby. Hello. Okay. There we go. Hello world. Dan has four children. He makes eight fifty an hour. Not too far from the truth. All right. So let's come. Let's start moving on here. Let's talk about this control flow. So sometimes we want code to execute. Other times we want to skip over. I say if is rich, then give myself a friendly message. Uh, one thing I should note, just like when you're doing HTML and you define an opening P tag, for example, good thing to do is just define the closing tag as fast as you can. So when you're programming in Ruby and you open up one of these if blocks, you have to close it off somehow. You got to cap it off. Uh, you simply type in end. That lets the Ruby interpreter know that uh, this if statement has come to a conclusion. Um, continue on executing apart from that. So in here, we can say, uh, say mo money, mo problems. All right. Let's try executing that. Starting from the top to the bottom, mo money, mo problems. Let's try, see what's gonna happen if I say false. Nothing, right? Skipped over that, that's the control flow. We didn't want that code to be executed in this case. All sorts of different ways to evaluate to true and false, but when you're talking about ifs and else ifs, um, Everything boils down to true and false, no matter how long the expression provided. So let's uh, add let's add a contingency, or let's add an else. Uh, I don't know. Get it together, Dan. All right, let's try this. Okay, so in this case, you know, not rich, skip over this line of code, jump back down to the else. So the else is that catch-all. And we can sandwich as many conditions in between here as we want. Let's do that. We can use what's called the else if. Now, if any of you have actually programmed in any other languages, this is probably a little bit more common. You'll see else if. JavaScript is a good example. Uh, Java, C sharp. Lots of languages do it like this. Ruby is like that. Else if. It just takes out the E and sticks them together. Um, just 
general interest, Python looks like that, lif. So just something to be aware of. Else if some other condition. So else never takes a condition. Else if and if always take a condition. You can't have something apart from this. And if I'm to execute my program now, I look like Cloud9 is even trying to be helpful here, right? It's telling me I've got a syntax error. And if I try to execute my program, it's going to tell me the same thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Syntax error, unexpected keyword else. Ruby doesn't know what to do with this. Doesn't make any sense, right? This is like someone comes up to you and starts talking backwards or, you know, that, who knows? Can't figure out what's happening here. That's actually a good way to describe it. It's talking backwards. This is not, this defies convention. Like my brain is not wired since the day I started learning language, right? This doesn't make sense. Same is true of Ruby. I need to provide a condition here. Uh, what should I do? I should say num children is greater than zero. I will say puts uh, no money, mo problems. I don't know. Abundant joy. There we are. So in this case, let's check it out. Let's run this. See what happens. Okay. No money, abundant joy. I'm not rich, but I've got greater than zero children. I can swap this around. I don't know. Maybe, maybe now I've got zero children. Oops. Oh, get it together. All right. Got to go find me a wife. Find me a job for crying out loud. All right. So let's change that back. Okay, good to go. So far, so good. Any questions? It's easy when I do it, right? It's easy to watch. It makes perfect sense. Eventually, you guys are going to have to do it. Yes, question. I'm just curious. So, when you find this program there, how do you know that you're going to get this is how you are going to define your app within the bounds provided by Sinatra. Sinatra is a Ruby program in files just like this. Sinatra is just offering constraints because the web, you know, it has its protocols, it has its standards, certain expectations. Sinatra makes it so that you have to meet those expectations. You want a program? A Sinatra application, you need to know Ruby. That's the language we use. So Ruby's different, right? Sinatra is just a Ruby program, just like anything else. This will be on the server side, right? So now we've uh, uh, focused exclusively up until this point on the client side. Just browser stuff. We don't to do what we've been doing so far. We don't even need a server. We just need a web browser and a text editor. What we're doing now is we're we're leaping from that from the browser to the the machine off in the cloud uh, that is receiving the requests sent by the browser. To be able to receive those requests, you need to write. Well, in this case, we're writing a Sinatra application. You need something on the back end to receive these requests process them. Um, Ruby's just one of many languages. I would say it's probably one of the best ones. Opinion, right? I like JavaScript, but Ruby is just so much nicer in so many ways. Any other questions? That's a good one. Okay. So yeah, basically, in a nutshell, we're focusing on the, the back end, or at least where we're stepping into the back end right now. Okay, so moving forward. Uh, let's uh, let's drop, bring this back. Now, maybe this will help out too. Uh, let's bring this back to my recycling app or my, my salvage app. <clears throat> and you're going to see something a little bit like this when you're, you're doing your, your coursework. So I'm going to define a new variable. It's going to become a hash. And I've got a water heater I found somewhere, let's say. <clears throat> now, think back to, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, let me just get a drink of water here. Okay, so now think back to my application. 
what were some of the common points of data that we need to manage here? So an obvious one would be the GPS coordinates. I'll define a key, I'll say coordinates, and then I'll assign it a value. And this is what's gonna contain, uh, you know, that, uh, uh, that, that string of digits. And I just got one handy ready to go here. So I'm gonna copy, I'll show you some real GPS coordinates instead of just making them up. It's good to be, you know, as real as possible. So at this point, I've got a water heater located somewhere at these coordinates. Uh, my data is contained. Let's, let's just try this out. Let's say puts water heater and see what gets put out to screen. Okay, so we got, uh, we kind of see what we already defined. We got our hashtag, you know, we got your opening curly brace. We've got our symbol here for coordinate and we've got the actual value that I've assigned. So not, not unlike CSS. If I want to retrieve any one of these values, and I've, I've only actually got one at this point, but I would say, or I'll, I'll double it up. Hopefully this uh, might help clarify. I just tell it what, I, I provided a key. Key, value. I provided the key, which in this case is coordinate. I guess I should say coordinates. So I got two. Or I guess, I don't know, is that one or two? Let's say coordinates. Execute my program. So here's where I'm outputting the hash in its entirety. And here's where I'm just referencing that key and retrieving that specific value. So what are some of the other values that uh, accompany, uh, you know, a, a, a discovery, salvage? Think to my web page. What do we see on the screen? Picture. Picture, yep. So I'll say image. I'll just make one up here. I'll say images. Um, dot JPEG. Notice what I did there. I'm only using single quotes. In this case, it doesn't matter. I kind of forgot to show you that actually. In this case, they're interchangeable. What else? What else do I see on my web page? Well, I got that covered in the coordinates. Something else. Though. Description. Thank you. I'll say some rusted out. Old water heater. All right. Let's run the program to see how that uh, that changes things. So my my hash has gotten a lot bigger, and I've got three key value pairs contained in the side of this thing. Who on earth? Community auction site. You wouldn't believe how many good deals I got off of that. All right. Uh, image. We could just retrieve these things one at a time. See if I made any typos. There we are. My coordinates, my image, uh, description of what I found, and uh, just one, one extra thing, and this is something I'm going to uh, implement as we go forward, uh, demonstrating and building this application. I'm going to have something similar to this, and this is something similar in your Instagram as well. So days ago, well, I discovered this one, let's say one day ago, like that, okay. So, and this is something you're going to get very, you know, uh, accustomed to when you're uh, displaying this stuff to screen. I might say water heater. Uh, let's uh, description. Feels like I'm making a mistake here somewhere already. Water heater description. Let's just make sure that works. So it's not gonna to be too much different. I kind of deleted some code there. Oh yeah. What error did I make? What? Yes. There's no such method called 
put it's got to have an s put string let's try it again okay so here's my some rusted out old water heater let's uh just make uh, let's extend this example just a little bit we'll say uh, was posted every time i want to retrieve one of these values i have to tell it what i'm retrieving from days ago and i'm going to be lazy for the moment we'll put uh in brackets in case you know it's going to be one days ago that's super lazy but all right try that again some rusted out old water heater was posted one days ago so far so good Okay, so let's uh, let's say you know we're going to do this a little bit nicer because you know people are going to post on the app and it's going to go for weeks and weeks and weeks. You know, um, there's going to have to be some level of like freshness. Uh, was this just discovered? Can I go there and expect to find it, or is this just going to be like you know it's all going to be gone, or the city came and picked it up, or or something? So I'm going to make one of these conditions. I'm going to say if water heater days ago. Is less than two uh, we'll just output something to the screen we'll say this is a, a fresh find I'll cap it all off with an end okay so at this point yeah, it's a fresh find. so what's happening we'll just break it down really slowly I've already defined my water heater up here and it always executes from top to bottom I reference the water heater and inside of that I reference uh, the value associated with the days ago key so this uh, the Ruby interpreter looks at this retrieves this value from memory and it starts doing this these boolean logic operations so the value here of course what this returns is one one is or is asking is one less than two true so execute this code Okay, let's span this out a little bit because you know days and weeks and months are going to go by uh let's make a different condition well let's start with the else let's do the catch the catch all if it hasn't been found yet it's probably gone so i'm going to ask you a question so it's still executing this it's currently a fresh find uh so let's say i go up to here and now my water heater post is now two days old. When I come down here and execute, what am I gonna find? Am I gonna find a fresh find or probably gone? Probably gone. Why? Because it's equal to two. Exactly. Two is not less than two, right? False. That doesn't make any sense. Well, it does make sense. It's, you know, it's a logical operation. Uh, makes perfect sense in this case. Um, it's gonna skip over this uh, fresh find and execute whatever it finds in the else. So, you know, there's gotta be like some middle ground there, obviously. Let's add an else if. And I need a condition for this one, I'll say, well, if my water heater is, uh, you know, if it was posted greater than or equal to two days ago, That's how you do it greater than or equal to puts, uh, let's say it's getting stale. You know, maybe it's been picked over. Maybe the, you know, other scavengers have already come and taken all the good loot. All right. So I execute now. It says it's getting stale. Okay. So it was posted two days ago. Someone's watching my app. You know, thousands of people are looking at this thing. Definitely going to go get it. Uh, let's say this is way down the list. This is like, you know, almost, a, you know, it's about two thirds of a year ago. What's going to be put out to screen? Yes, getting stale. I was trying to catch you there, actually. What I want to show is that uh, in this case, I mean, else is never going to get executed. Well, yeah, no, it, it can never be executed. This code um, 
will never pass through the interpreter. So we got to like, you know, tighten this a little bit. We got to make our, our Boolean operation or this Boolean expression a little bit more constrained. So let's say, okay, if my water heater is, and I'm going to copy and paste this to save myself some typing. My water heater is less or greater than or equal to two days ago. And uh, let's say less than a week. So after, you know, after seven days, this thing is going to get, uh, it's probably gone. Now, whoops, it's probably gone. Does that make sense? You don't have to do too much complex. Um, you don't have to define too many complex conditions, but this is very, uh, very common. So what you see here is the and, and I think we all have kind of uh, an intuitive nature, uh, intuitive idea of what and does. This ampersand ampersand means and. So if, what is this? 200 is greater than or equal to two. That's true. 200 is less than seven. That's false. True and false equals false. What about true or? True or false. What's that going to evaluate to? True. Exactly. It just has to be one. You could have a hundred of these conditions. As long as one of them is true, the whole expression becomes true. Let's try it out. So now we're back in that position where we're never going to execute this ever. That or condition just messes everything up. So I'm going to I'm going to set that back. There we go. Okay. So now this is a really handy piece of code that I can use in my in my web application because I'm going to have all these posts. You know, people are going to come along here. They're going to see a description. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, you know, it's still pretty fresh. Fresh fine. I better get out. Go get it. Um, I want to do this over and over and over again, right? So this is where the point is, or the, the point where we could start taking this and copying and pasting it every, every, everywhere we go, right? Everywhere we need this code, let's just copy and paste it. Terrible idea, right? Don't repeat yourself. This is where the method steps in. So, but before I do that, I'm going to uh, define another value. Let's say... Just, just to show you what I'm talking about here. Um, let's say I found some sidewalk bricks. And, you know, I'll give it a description. Pile of old sidewalk bricks. Separated with a comma. I haven't stressed that very much. I should stress that. In uh, CSS, you're, you're familiar with the semicolon. Uh, when we're defining hashes, no semicolon comma. Kind of forgot to mention that. I'll give it some coordinates. This is just an example. So I'm just going to copy and paste the ones I have up here. In fact, I'll get some, I'll get all of this stuff. Why not? Nope. Get this one. There we go. So I got some coordinates. Uh, maybe my image is called sidewalk, sidewalkbricks.jpg. And days ago, uh, I don't know, it's been, it's been over a week. It's been nine days. So I haven't really done anything functionally. Um, you know, this is, this, there's definitely stuff going on behind the scenes, but it's not visible. I just want to make sure it's working. That's all I'm doing right now. I want to make sure that there's no uh, premature halt. I want to make sure it goes uh, all the way through to execution. Okay. So this is this kind of scenario I'm trying to avoid here. So I've already double, I've already pasted this. If I want to use this code again, you know, it's basically the same code, but now instead of a water heater, now I'm talking about, so, whoop. Ah. Shoot. instead of a water heater, I'm talking about sidewalk bricks. There we go. This will get tiresome pretty fast if you keep copying and pasting, but we're still we're applying the same code to the uh, a different chunk of data. Let's try it out. 
Uh, they're both probably gone. Let's just make sure that we're stressing the point that this is in fact different. We'll say two days ago. So one is getting stale right at the bottom of the, the output there. One is getting stale. One is probably gone. Okay, so let's, uh, let's solve this problem. We don't want to keep copying and pasting code. We don't want to say if water heater and then have to come down here and say, well, if sidewalk works. We, we just want some general purpose code that we can slot in uh, wherever we feel it's appropriate. So let's try... Uh, we'll define a new method, and it's going to be called def get freshness. It's like a gum commercial or something. Get freshness, and there we are. So now whatever I define in here is just going to be all bundled up, and we're going to be able to type in the words get freshness with uh, the days parameter. And we're going to be able to call it anywhere in our code. So, you know, I'm just going to do it as easy and lazy as possible. I'm going to grab that code, stick it on here. We still got a problem. I mean, this isn't uh, really going to execute the way I want it to. Uh, because um, whenever I call it, it's only going to be talking about sidewalk bricks, right? So I, I've got this variable. And in this case... Uh, can it be seen? I don't know, mentors, what do you think? Is this out of scope? Sidewalk bricks? I know, I'm just keeping you on a toes. <laughs> it's kind of unfair, but let's try it out. Okay, so let's say, uh, let's come down here, say get freshness, and I'll just give it, you know, 100 days. It's not gonna do anything because this 100 is gonna get assigned to this parameter. We're not actually using it anywhere, not yet, anyway. So let's, uh, let's see if it works. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. So this, this is your introduction to scope. I actually wasn't expecting this. I thought uh, it would be able to see sidewalk bricks. Um, yeah, this is what we call scope. This variable here, nested inside of this block of code, this is like in a world all by itself. Whatever's inside this world, it can't see what's outside of the world. Even though we defined uh, a variable up here, this is something completely different. This doesn't hasn't doesn't exist, right? We could define it inside the method, but at this point, you know, that, that'd just be silly. So what I'm gonna do just to make this thing work now, is I'll say days. Right? I'm calling my method down here, and I can pass it any value I want. In this case, I'm passing it 100. 100 gets assigned here. And it starts running these tests. And of course, I've got to update this stuff as well. Days. And days. That should work. All right, so this should output, and I'm going to clear up some of the clutter here. Give you a, a tip in the, in the meantime. If you find yourself, you know, you're, you're kind of unsure about this code or you want to try something different, you can make it so that the Ruby interpreter will ignore it. And that's very easy. All you need to do is prefix it with uh, a hash. This is, uh, whoops, whoa, what happened, what happened? It kind of goes gray like that. That means Ruby, whatever's behind these hashes, Ruby's just gonna skip over that stuff. It's just gonna ignore it. This is a really helpful way so you can leave yourself notes or just try stuff out like this, right? You've got some problem problematic code. Uh, you think you got a solution, comment out the problematic code, try it out with uh, your new solution. And if one works, then great. If not, you can go back to the old one by uncommenting. So uh, I cleared out a little bit of the clutter. Still got a little bit there, but let's try it again. Uh-oh. What did I do? Sorry? About the S. Yeah. Uh, well, either I forgot the S or I added too many S's. I think uh, in this case, yeah, I, I forgot the S. I think that's fair. Thank you. All right. So this time, let's try it again. Okay. So, yeah, there it is. It's probably gone. Let's try it. Let's get a little, let's get a little bit fancier. Oh, let's even get fancier. Let's take out these puts. Watch, what, what, watch the difference here. And actually, before I do that, just to 
hammer this point home. I'm going to get rid of this one. Just clear out some of the clutter. And now, of course, I'll I'll give this all to you as part of the course notes. Um, did I not save that? No, I didn't save it. Let's try that again. Okay, still got. Oh yeah, so this is the last one here. I mean, you know, just uh, just to give ourselves a, a visual marker, I'll say method calls. Now we're all on the same page. Method calls. Okay, so it's probably gone. Let's try two. Probably gone, getting stale. So over and over and over again. We can call this as many times as we want. We can even just, you know, take this and <laughs> as many times as we want. It's getting stale, getting old, getting old, getting old. All right. Let's take all that stuff out. Oh, I did a lot of them. There we are. I want to dress this up just a little bit, though. So really, the, the ultimate purpose is I want to be able to take, uh, you know, these uh, hashes that I've defined, or at least the values contained inside of them. So I've got two. I've got my water heater, which has that days ago property. So that's one I can call it on. Hopefully, you're seeing how this, uh, this could potentially be valuable to you. Uh, water heater and sidewalk bricks. Still not super satisfied with you this. Um, and the reason is, is because remember how we did that like put S thing inside the Ruby interpreter and we said puts hello world and it had that nil, right? In this case, this is returning nil and that's just kind of goofy. So really all I want to do, I don't want this... I don't want it to be the job of this method to output stuff to screen. I just want that to happen somewhere else. How do I return a value? If you've been paying attention. How do I return a value from a method? What is the rule there? The last line to be executed in the method is the value that gets returned to the call in context. So I'm going to take these puts out. And when I call this method now, it's not going to print anything to screen. It's simply going to return these strings. So if this value is one, fresh find is going to be returned here, but not output to screen. Watch what happens. So I still got my method calls, but it doesn't look like anything's happening. Let's give ourselves some feedback. Puts. This is a, a much more natural and flexible way to do this. You're just going to have to take my word for it. But hopefully you see the distinction here. Uh, we're not outputting anything here. We actually want something to be returned other than nil. When I execute, those values get returned to the call in context, which then in turn gets passed to put S, which then in turn outputs it to standard out and does all the the operating system interfacing and all that kind of stuff. All right. Now we had one more concept. And that was the array. Very useful, different than the hash. Just a way to, you know, uh, I guess a, arguably a looser, a looser structuring of your data, whereas the hash is very tight, very well defined. Uh, you got a little bit more flexibility with an array. Uh, well, in, in certain, in a certain sense, at least. Let's uh, let's say we'll just call it posts. Whoops, 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 whoops. Posts uh, opening and closing. Array is denoted by or delimited by square brackets, and you can stick anything in here. So I'm going to put my water heater, and I'm going to put my sidewalk bricks. And just to show you what's contained inside of what it actually looks like on the screen, I'm going to put that post, put that out to, to the standard output. So it's not, it didn't crash. Here's my array. I've got my very first one, which is the old water heater. You can see it up to there. And then there's where it ends. 
Right? You can see where it begins and ends with the curly braces. The next one comes up. So I've got two items in my array. It begins and ends there. So now Ruby in pretty much every programming language, I always hesitate to say every, um, but we have ways that we can handle this data and uh, look at each individual item uh, very quickly. So this isn't something that was actually covered in the slides. We did talk about arrays, but I want to show you really quickly, uh, no matter how long this array is, we can look at each item uh, one at a time and you know do it in, in, in milliseconds. So let's take that out. And I will say posts each. So now posts is an object, just like everything in Ruby. And objects often, almost always, have methods attached to them. So we defined our own method. We defined that uh, get freshness method. But inside, we can put these methods inside of objects. This is like a next week topic. But that's what's happening here. This is all part of Ruby. Uh, post, just because it's an array object, has an each method, which does this. It takes what we call a block. And for each item in the array, It looks, starts at the beginning, starts at index zero, executes some code on that, that, uh, that item, and then moves on to the next one. And in each pass and in each iteration, gets assigned to this post variable. Let me show you what I mean. So I'll just output this to screen, really simple. Uh, I'll say post, uh, let's say description. Execute my program. Here's my array. Here's that for each loop. The first description, description, some rusted out old water heater, and the second description, sidewalk bricks. So you're going to see this uh, right away because you're going to be doing the exact same thing with your posts. And uh, you know, taking that collection of data, just looking at each item one at a time, and then outputting it to your um, uh, your your uh, to the client, to the browser. <clears throat> okay. Let's see what happens. It's a good. That's an excellent question, and this is this is how you learn uh, about how this stuff works. So, what happens if I don't actually have? So, where uh, where's my? Let's try sidewalk bricks just because it's close at hand. There's no description, right? So, I'm I'm taking out the description. I still got a description in old water heater. I have no description in sidewalk blocks. So it's going to start with water heater. It's going to print out some rusted old water heater, and then it's going to get to the sidewalk bricks. What's it going to do? Let's find out. Nothing. It's nice enough to not crash, but it's returning nothing. It's, it's undefined. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. It is. It is definitely an empty line. Uh, we can we can verify that. We could say description. What I think, um, you know, I'd have to actually well, like. Oh wait, I'm doing JavaScript. Shoot, so I'd do. there we are. Oops, 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 oops. Okay, what's the problem? Where did I mess up? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. That was uh, kind of one of these consequences of uh, Cloud9 being very helpful to a fault. So let's try that again. There it is. So it's returning no, right? And, and we can even verify that further. We just put this down here. Puts this is what nil looks like. And we can interpret it, inter interpolate it. Nil's a weird thing, right? It's it's there, but it's not. Funny thing. This is what nil looks like. There you go. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I will uh, bring this all together in a in a summary, and uh, we have our mentors.